Well, good morning. It is great to be at church today, isn't it? It's a great day to be at church, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Can we all stand? Um, and we are going to worship the Lord. Um,
Let's lift up praise to our God together right now with audible, out loud, just vocalization of our thanks to him. We love you, God. We praise you. You are on your throne. You are mighty and you are powerful. Everything is yours, God. All of creation belongs to you. We are yours too. We belong to you. You made us and you designed us and you fashioned us in your likeness. We are honored to come to your house, Lord. We are honored to be guests at your table. And we pray that today you, Lord, would just, Lord, fellowship with us. Make your presence very real to each one of us in a very, very special way. Throughout this gathering, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Say a big amen with me. Amen. God bless you. Be seated for just a moment. I want to share a couple of things with you. Uh, first off, if you are a guest here today, we just welcome you so much here at Buckeye First Assembly. 
And hopefully, if we did our job right, you received a worship guide as you were coming in the door. If you didn't, uh, one of our people can get one in your hands. But uh, it, it, each week it has sermon notes on there, and it also has uh, just a, a brief description of who we are as a church. And who we are as a church is that we are serious Christ followers led by the Spirit of God, And a phrase that we often say is, find purpose in Christ and share. That sums up what our goals are, our dreams. We find our significance and our meaning in Jesus Christ. And when we do that, then we want to just share it with everyone around us. We invite you to join us on the journey, especially if you're new to us today. If you are joining us with a for the very first time, or the first time maybe in a long time, or if you've been two or three times and you're just sort of sort of uh, window shopping and praying about where you want to go to church, we would love for you to join us here on this journey. There's two ways that you can get connected with us. One, on that worship guide, it gives a connect card down at the bottom. Just tear it off. You can, you can write in your name, phone number, and email. We would appreciate that so much. Just tear it off, put it in that black box at the back of the room. Or if you would rather do it, you can text the word CONNECT to this phone number, and it does the same thing, um, 602-833-0075. They'll leave that on the screen for just a moment. might help to take your device out and just snap a picture of that or do a screenshot if you're wa- watching online. Uh, because we really, truly would love to get connected with you, and we're glad you're worshiping with us here today. And I want to uh, just share with you um, a little story as we're receiving the offering. Um, First, I I do want to just say, um, I'm glad to get $1,400 of money back from the government. I hope you're glad to get that too. I you know, who isn't thrilled about getting money? I know we all have a lot of feelings about that. Boy, I just pretty, I'm pretty nervous. I know we can't print money out of the air, you know, so uh, $1.9 trillion, a lot of money. But could I just suggest something? Um, Would you use this money that you get back from the stimulus program? Would you consider tithing on the $1,400 that comes into your hands? Would you do that? If you Listen, if you would do that, just think what a blessing it would be to your church if all of the people who received a $1,400 stimulus check, if you were to give $140 to your church, just a tithe. What a blessing that would be um, to your church family. So would you consider doing that? And then I just want to share with you a lot of our people give generously to missions faithfully every every month some do it every week it's easier that way some do it monthly some prefer to do it one time um, a big amount just once for the whole year however god leads you please please support this cause but i want to just share with you the story of a muslim man his name is uh, kimasu no kamisu kamisu and he is an imam, or he was an imam. If you don't know what that is, in the Muslim religion, that would be like the priest, sort of like the pastor, the one who's in charge down at the local mosque. And so uh, this this comes to us from Ethiopia. It's a true story from John Easter, who is, um, he is over a ministry called Africa's Hope. And just recently, John shared this story in the form of a newsletter. So um, so Kimasu, um, the imam, was angry about a fellow Ethiopian who was going to preach an evangelical service, and uh, this man had become a, a very serious Christian, and, and he was preaching at the, at the local church, and uh, Kimasu got so upset about it, so angry about it, that he, He literally, he just wanted to attack the man and kill him. And he actually went so far as getting a a group of men together that he said, come and join with me. And while he's up there preaching, we'll kill him. And so they literally came and ambushed the worship service and walked in and started throwing rocks at the preacher. They were going to stone him to death. But in the moment as he picked up a rock and he was about to throw it, 
terror came all over him. He stood there shaking, and he didn't quite understand it, but he's the one that organized it, but he himself turned around and started yelling at the men that were attacking and, they, and said, you, you go home, you leave him alone. And, and he was so troubled by this experience, he didn't know what to do with it, so he went back to his house and he was just exhausted and he fell asleep. And in, in his sleep, he had a dream and it was an appearance of Jesus Christ who came to him and said to him, actually the man that you were trying to kill has good news. You need to go back to him, humble yourself, ask his forgiveness, and ask him to tell you about this man Jesus that he's preaching about. So he did that. He goes back to the crusade, and immediately he goes to the man and says, please forgive me. I don't understand what's going on, but a man named Jesus appeared to me in a dream, and he told me that you could help me. That night, the local imam, the leader of the mosque, asked Jesus into his heart and got saved. And this is now 18 months later when John wrote the letter about him, and, and uh, the story goes that immediately God called him into ministry. And so the man who was an imam at the local mosque suddenly became a preacher of Jesus Christ. And after 18 months, he had already planted two churches that are growing by leaps and bounds. So he is a modern-day Apostle Paul that was literally attacking Christianity. And God said, why are you attacking me? And changed his heart, and now he's serving Jesus. So I just want to share that great story with you. Whenever you support world missions, these are the kinds of things that you're getting behind. And so be faithful and generous. Keep giving to support our missionaries. Let's, let's pray over the offering today. Father, we, we give thanks for the opportunity of sowing our seed into the kingdom. We believe it's good seed. We believe it's going to reap great results. Father, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that more miracles like this would happen. Bless your people as we get behind your vision, as we, as we sense your heartbeat, and that we do everything within our power, and even our finances is affected by it. We generously give into your kingdom because we know, Lord, that you are going to take care of every need. And we believe that it's, it's though it doesn't make sense mathematically, it is better to live on 90% and give you your 10% than it is to try to, to hoard all of the 100% to ourselves. We know that you have funny math, and we believe that you work in each and every situation. So I'm just praying that you would bless everyone who is giving in the offering today. Bless them and encourage them and take care of them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And I forgot to mention, you can give in that black box after church or even during church. We don't mind. Or you can give digitally online. Many of you do that uh, at bfachurch.org or on the BFA app. Thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing more songs of worship right now.
feel the Lord saying, keep your eyes on me, my children. Keep your eyes focused on me. Do not be distracted by peripheral things, but let your gaze, let your focus be entirely upon me. And if you will watch carefully, and if you will see and behold your king, then let any trial come that may, even let the earth give sway, but the word of the Lord will stand forever, and you will stand the test of time. My sheep hear me, they recognize my voice, and they obey. So don't worry about the stormy weather on the other side of the hill, across the range. Only trust your good shepherd who is leading you into green pastures. Eat until your soul is filled and trust your good shepherd. I am your shepherd, says the Lord. I lead my children into green pastures. I protect my sheep. I keep them safe. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes fixed upon me. Gaze upon me. And you will be okay, says the Lord.
Would you just lift up your voices and let's declare how great he is all over this room. Come on, you surely you got some sound that can come out of your mouth to give praise to Almighty God. Let's just let there be an ovation of worship. Oh, glory to you, God. Praise your mighty name. Hallelujah, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great is your name. <laughs> praise you, oh God. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Come on now, let's just put our hands together and give an applause of worship to our risen King. Praise His name. Well, glory to God. Some of you already sat down, and that's always fine. That's always fine. But I'd like to ask you, if you would, move around, greet one another, be respectful of space. and But take a moment to get close enough where you can see their eyes and wave and, and, and give that air high five, kind of, you know, like Sharon and I are doing right now. And just uh, greet one another and just enjoy fellowshipping for, hey, let's take 60, 90 seconds to just do that. Would you just go around and meet folks? God bless you. Thanks so much, you guys. I appreciate that very much. I wish all of you would get as excited as Brother Carlos. Amen. Woo. Hallelujah. We're excited to be in God's house. Amen. Yes, um, God has set us free and he's liberated us. So, um, And uh, it is just good to see all of your smiling faces and just to enjoy being able to worship together. Hey, I just want to say a word. I know that these are different days, but I want you to just think about for a moment, just think about what it was like last year when we were getting close to Easter time. And we, we couldn't even meet in the same room. Remember that? I mean, um, how, how blessed are we that we get to come together with brothers and sisters and, and just enjoy uh, worshiping the Lord together. So um, Easter is three weeks from today. That's a wonderful opportunity to invite people to come and join you at your church. And if you, uh, if you haven't already done it, consider inviting someone to come to be with you at Buckeye First Assembly on that day. That's a special day. Um, I, I'll tell you something. People are more likely to come and be with you um, for Easter than any other time of the year. So invite folks and bring them with you. Uh, to the Lord's house on that day. Well, uh, the series is called Careful, and I'm, I'm really using it in another way. You know that. Um, to be careful is to be filled with care, to be full of compassion. And I think Jesus is the one who models that for us. Um, he really is the one who teaches us to be careful. To be, think about it, to be filled with care, to be full of compassion. I can't think of anyone who embodies that more than Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. I wish you would remember to be filled with compassion for uh, some of the folks of our church family. I would continue to pray for Pastor Mo and Leah as they're uh, battling sickness, and um, we're hoping that they'll be able to be back with us next Sunday and and they're, they're doing everything by the book the way they should. And just keep them lifted up in prayer. Pray for um, the family of Flo Pori this Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Any of you who can come, please come and join us uh, at Thompson Funeral Chapel. That's over in Goodyear uh, for the service. And I know it will mean a lot to the family. Um, we're praying for the Pori family. I, I love I love Flo. I love 
so much, um, Anthony and Flo Poiré, and they're both in heaven now. They both had impact on, on uh, Stephanie and me in ways that are so profound. We love them dearly, and um, we're going to miss them. And, and then also don't forget that on April 3rd, that's Saturday before Easter, is Pat Zabriskie's service, and that will be here at 10 a.m. that Saturday morning, and it will be live streamed. If you're not able to be here, maybe you can catch it on, online. But be praying for these folks and just l keep them lifted up. Be careful towards them and be careful towards other people in our, our church family. Um, and I'll, I'll just say this, this message today, in order to be full of care, you're going to have to be more careful than ever. Um, of course, let's start with this phrase and say it with me. We've said it each week. Say, echo it right after me when I say it. Bringing along, coming alongside, bearing up. You know, that's the body of Christ, isn't it? Let's say it all together. Just lift your voices. Say it right along with me. Bringing along, coming alongside, bearing up, careful. Um, that really is Jesus' heart. So now today the sermon is titled, Temp Taken. And yes, these misspelled words, all of them, are a play on words. And this one today is about self-care, something that we very often overlook. Uh, don't allow yourself to be taken by temptation. Don't, don't allow it. Just determine right now that I am not going to allow the enemy to take me via temptation. There is... Um, Really, there's this overarching theme verse to, to the whole series of messages. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse number 3. By the way, these are words that Isaiah spoke 700 years before Jesus was ever born as the Messiah. But Isaiah said when he comes, when the Messiah comes, here's what he's going to be like. A bruised reed he will not break. In a smoldering wick, he will not snuff out. Jesus is not the kind of person to ever give up on anybody. Jesus will always hope for all humans to come to him and be rescued and be saved. Now, almost everyone has been weak at some time or another. Almost everyone has been strong at some time or another. And I guess I should say, and I've been thinking, when would I say this in this series? Because it is important to know this. On rare, rare occasions, when someone just absolutely refuses God, pushes Him away, and will not have anything to do with Him, and just continually resists the Holy Spirit and wants nothing to do with Him, and even goes as far as cursing God and being angry towards God and resisting the Holy Spirit. Well, the Bible does speak of there are those rare occasions where um, when someone has rebelled to that degree, it, God does this. He gives them over to a reprobate mind. But... But that is so rare. And what you need to know is the very fact that someone is concerned that maybe they crossed that line is proof enough that they have not. If they even care at all, then that shows that they are still a potential uh, servant of Jesus Christ. But it's important to know this about Jesus the Messiah. He will go to the nth degree to help the weakened and the disenfranchised and the beaten down and the hopeless. He will go to the nth degree to help the one who has experienced injustice, 
the misunderstood, the underprivileged. Jesus roots for the underdog. And that's the Jesus that we serve, and he's the one we're talking about in this series. Now, just uh, real quick, I, I want to remind you of the flyby, the aerial view of, of this whole series. And if you haven't been able to be here for each of the, seri- each of the sermons, or if you have not uh, been able to catch them online, I would really encourage you to go back and watch any one of them that you've missed. Because what we're doing, we're looking at, at really, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, through... 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, that block of scriptures. And it's a very specific uh, part of the scriptures where Paul is addressing one thing, meat that has been sacrificed to idols, and what should Christians do? How do Christians respond to that? But he uses it for a very important teaching, and it's primarily this. It's primarily about caring for others so much that you suppress your own rights in order to better the other individual and lift them up. This this section that we're looking at, uh, first week um, I talked about being, being strong for weak Christians. Careful being full of care. Last week, um, we talked about being strong for weak non-believers. I have become all things to all people so that by all available means, I might save some. All for the sake of some. All some. And today, we talk about being strong for our weak selves Temptation. It's all about dealing with temptation in a healthy way. And next week on the last Sunday of the series, uh, which, by the way, will lead us up to Palm Sunday and then Easter Resurrection Day, um, we will be on that day talking about the Lord Jesus who became weak so that we could be strong. We have to follow his example. The message that day will be called Fall Ample, and I hope you will be here for it. So I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is our text for today, uh, verses 11, 12, and 13. I encourage you to follow along. Take out your Bible or your device. Follow along. It will be on the screen too. Hey, take notes for yourself. Pray that God will speak something to your heart today. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, just before this text, guess what? The Apostle Paul was talking about food. Food sacrificed to idols. He started it in chapter 8, verse 1. He addresses it in chapter 9. And here in chapter 10, at the beginning, yep, same thing. He's talking about food, sacrificed to idols. And after, after this section of Scripture, he's talking about, you guessed it, food. But not food sacrificed to idols. Rather, food that, honor, food that honors the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you and me. Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. He starts to talk about the importance of communion and the proper way to receive communion. Now, this morning, I'm using the imagery of a submarine. And 
I'm way out of my expertise when I talk about this. In fact, we've got some guys here in the church that have been on submarines, or I know at least one for sure that's been on submarines, maybe others. I know we've got some guys that have been on aircraft carriers. Um, those guys would be way better qualified to talk about submarines than, than me. But I'm going to use that image this morning uh, because it really conveys the truth that I want to bring home to you about temptation. And I invite you to break down these verses with me as we look at them again and we work our way through verse 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. To me, this verse is just like a periscope on a submarine saying, let's just take a periscope and look at the past. This is the Apostle Paul saying, let's periscope the past and let's see what we find from it. Put up that periscope and survey where we've been and what happened to them. These things happened to them as examples and were often written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. Notice those words. He says, these things happened. What things, Paul? What things are you talking about that happened? Well, it's just very interesting if you read the first 10 verses. He's talking about the Israelites and how they had food that was provided for them when they're leaving out of the land of Egypt into the wilderness and they're going to the promised land. He says to, to the current audience, the church in Corinth, he says, hey, our forefathers, they had the same spiritual food that we have. They had the same spiritual drink that we have. That's verse 3. But then he says, but we don't want God to be displeased with us the same way he was displeased with many of them. Why? Why was he displeased with them? Because verse 6, because their hearts were set on evil things. In other words, they gave in to temptations. Their heart fixated on something that they knew was wrong. And it drew them away. Now, these words in verse number 13 are really important. What is common to mankind? This, in fact, is going to provide us with the first point I want to bring out this morning. What is common to mankind? Point number one is, we're all in the same boat. It's common to all mankind. Look at your neighbor and tell them, we're all in the same boat. We really are. We're all in the same boat. If, if anything, take encouragement that all the things you face... Everything that's so difficult, you're not alone. It is common to all mankind. The temptations that, uh, that you face, sometimes, sometimes you can think, well, I'm the only one who faces these temptations. These temptations are unique to me. What the devil will try to do is tell you, you know, this is unique, your story, what you've experienced, what you've been through is very unique. And after all, don't you really deserve to have some vice? And he will tempt you to try to move towards giving in to that temptation. Um, but the things that tempt you may not be the same things that tempt other people. I, I face temptations. I'm very grateful that I have never faced the temptation to try drugs or alcohol. It just has not been a temptation for me. It doesn't make me better than other people who have struggled with it because I'm just grateful that it just wasn't appealing to me. I just never, if I, if I sampled something today, that would be the first take. 
I've, I just never have been, it's never been appealing to me. But so the things that you face, the things that are temptations to you, you might think, well, this is unique to me. But here's the thing about it. All temptation does this. No matter what the temptation is, it always comes back to this. It is a temptation to resist God, a temptation to push God away, a temptation to disobey Him and follow your own selfish desires. That's at the heart of every temptation. Every person on earth faces temptation. And so that leads us to our second point, which is actually found in verse number 12. Be careful. Be careful that you don't fall. Look at your neighbor and say, be careful. Be careful that you don't fall. Now, here's the second point along those lines. First, we're all in the same boat, and we really are. But second, surface. Don't dive. You're in a submarine. You're tempted to just go deep. Don't do it. Surface. Don't dive. The way that Paul said that was be careful that you don't fall. Be very careful that you don't fall. By the way, just, just in the same way that Paul said, be careful in exercising your rights, in just the same way he says, be careful that you don't fall. Matthew Robert McGrew wrote his master's thesis on submarines. And he tells one story where human error caused a great catastrophe. It was back in 1918, it was part of World War I, and a sailor, uh, Matthew describes him as a green sailor, turned the wrong valve on a submarine. And the submarine began taking on unnecessary ballast, and it plunged nose first into the mud, 294 feet below the surface of Bantry Bay in Ireland. He wasn't being careful. He turned the wrong valve. He sunk the sub. When you are tempted, there is that moment, there's a moment when you decide, wait a minute. These thoughts that I'm entertaining, this behavior that I'm participating in, this is wrong. You, you may not recognize it immediately, but there's that point where it comes to you and you realize what I'm considering, this is wrong. And at that moment, the fury of hell and the wrath of Almighty God are converging upon you to make the right decision, not the wrong. There is a war going on inside of you. And so the wise man, at that moment, does not dive deeper. He cries out to God for help, and he does his best to surface. The wise woman resists the devil, knowing that he must flee from her as she resists him. That's what God expects of you and I. That's part of human experiences. When we're tempted, when we recognize it, there's a conscientious moment where we have a choice. Will I surface or will I dive deeper? God help us to have the courage to reach out to God and to pray and to do our very best to surface. Now, the next words I love because I want you to notice specifically about this effort on our part. When we're trying not to fall, when we're trying to surface, here's the thing. 
And this is how God is. He will always do this. Look at this. He will also provide a way out. Every time. Every time. Oh, but this temptation is so strong. You don't know the feelings that I wrestle with. And I lose all control. I have no ability to resist this temptation. God will provide a way out every single time if you're looking for it. Every single time. And so the third point, not only are we all in the same boat, not only do we make a decision, I've got to surface. Don't dive. But here's the thing. Open the escape hatch. Open the escape hatch. When you find yourself in those cold, dark waters and you're tempted to dive, but you recognize it and you say, God, bring me to the surface. And when he brings you to the surface, look for the escape hatch. Sometimes I've described it this way. Put your faith where your feet are and run for your life. A friend of mine, Rod Loy, pastor of a great church in Little Rock, North Little Rock, Arkansas. He always, he's a very well-known speaker. He always travels either with his wife or if she can't go with him, then there's a, a ministry partner, a man who goes with him to provide him accountability at all times. And someone one time said to him, Rod, what's wrong with you? Are you afraid that you're going to fall into sin? And he said, of course I am. But I put a buffer around me. I don't go into situations where I know I'm going to be dealing with temptation. What a refreshing approach. So, open the escape hatch. Look at the words again. He will also provide a way out. He will do that. There's a story of a man who was trapped in an underground cave. And it was pitch black. He had wandered in and then the daylight got away from him and he couldn't find his way back to the only opening to get out of the cave. And so in pitch black with his batteries gone from his, light, uh, from his flashlight, he's feeling his way, trying to get back to the opening. He died in that cave the people who discovered his body were shocked when they found that he was only an arm's length from the exit. He was that close. God will provide us with an escape. He's always going to give you an escape, but you have to look for the escape hatch. James has something to say about this, doesn't he? Now, I'm not going to put it on the screen, but I would really encourage you to follow along with James chapter 1, verses 13 and following. Here's what James says. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. None of this business of blaming God. We cannot do it, can we? We can't say, oh, well, God, it's your fault. You know, you made me this way and this is just who I am. No, no, sir. We must come to God and say, God, I don't know why this is such a struggle, but I am begging you. I'm reaching out to you. Oh God, be merciful. And listen, when you stumble, when you fall, God is always faithful. He is always kind and merciful. He is always forgiving. He wants us to confess our sin immediately. But if we will look for that escape hatch, he'll provide it. He'll give you the way out. We're all in the same boat. Surface, don't dive, open the escape hatch. Each week I'm ending with this phrase, I'll take the low road. Let me just say a little bit about this. 
I've shared uh, publicly my philosophy of ministry that is very different from what a lot of people do in ministry. But I truly believe that if we're going to follow Jesus, then it means becoming servants of all. Jesus says, if you want to become the greatest of all, become the servant of all. And he takes up the basin and the towel and he washes his disciples' feet. In a world that is so contradictory to that, in a world where it's all about stepping on top of one person to get up the rung on the ladder and climbing to the top and ascending and ascending and trying to make it to the top. And if you get to the top, sometimes it's so lonely at the top. But what I teach, and this has caused several people at different times, tell me about that because I don't quite understand what that means I teach rather than ascend to leadership, I teach that you should descend into leadership. You give away your rights and your privileges. You sacrifice more. The further you go in ministry, the more you lay down. The less potential I have to be offended by anything because I am His servant. And so we take the low road around here. Well, that doesn't sound very American. Well, it's frankly not. But it's biblical. And so, the reason I choose the phrase, I'll take the low road, it's that old Scottish song, you take the high road and I'll take the low road and I'll be in Scotland for ye. And it teaches a little twist and that is, I want you to take the prominent way and I'll kind of take the back heels way. But in the end, I'm trusting that it's all going to work out. And actually, if if my motives are pure, if my heart is pure, God's going to see to it that I get in Scotland before you. It's kind of a unique little folk song. And um, so the first week when we were talking about weak Christians, and no Christians are weak permanently. They're only weak at times. And strong at other times. And so learn to recognize the moment. And we took the low road. We said, you really matter to me. Remember that? You really matter to me. And, and I'm going to lay down my desires. I'm going to sacrifice so that I can see you elevated. That's, that's the most important thing. And then last week was about being strong for weak non-believers. And we said, I'll take the low road. And the way we did it was, you can save all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you can't save all the people all the time. In other words, I'll become all things to all people by all available means so that some will get saved. Whatever it takes, I'll take the low road. And today, I'm going to put on the screen that I'll take the low road by using another song. We all live in a yellow submarine. I was born on May 20th, 1966. That very week, the Beatles recorded the song, We All Live in a Yellow Submarine. It's a really different song for them. By the way, in the room, I'm probably the least knowledgeable about the Beatles. I never listened to... I grew up listening exclusively to Christian music. I don't know anything about them. I know their names. I know they're you know, famous and all of that. And, Um, But I'll bet you probably know a lot more about the Beatles than I do. Um, But when it was released in the United States, this song, it was long about the same time that John Lennon made the statement, we're more popular than Jesus Christ. And it was also about that time that the Beatles said, we are anti-war, we're against Vietnam War. So they were anti-establishment, anti-authorities, very, very controversial. Some say that this song was about drugs, um, that they were experimenting with LSD and other hallucinogenic drugs. In in fact, so there's a a lot of people that say that, that, that this was really about a psychedelic acid trip. That's what the... Living in the Yellow Submarine was all about. Many people say that. There are people that say, 
Uh, the yellow submarine is a reference to a yellow submarine-shaped pill called nimbutol capsules. They were large, elongated, bluntly rounded, and yellow capsules, and eventually the locals called them yellow submarines. But the Beatles denied that. They said, no, that's not it at all. Um, they always said that it was just a happy children's song. I don't know if you, you knew that. It was released as a children's song. became part of a very popular children's video and a movie that was at least targeting children. And, and so the song's about this happy captain who is on a submarine and he takes the children on the ride. So it's a tale that concerns young Fred, a sea captain, and his idyllic world of Pepperland, which is invaded by the music-hating blue meanies. He hijacks the yellow submarine and he makes his way to Liverpool where he beseeches the Beatles to come and bring back music to Pepperland and break the boring spell of the meanies. And all along the way, the crew, they embark on a series of surreal adventures. They lose Ringo in the sea of monsters and, and they get trapped in the sea of holes before unleashing Beatle music on the blue meanies. And it, they realize the error of their ways. John Lennon was not um, a believer. One of the things that he believed, he believed that all were born innocent, by, but they were corrupted by society. So he is writing about a, a happy escape, a chance to, to get away. So now what... What's the truth about the Yellow Submarine song? I don't know. Got me? I'm, I, bet, I bet you know more about it than me. But here's what I know. We all have a submarine side. Submarines are beneath the surface of the water. Subways are trains that ride underground. We have a sub-level part of us that needs to be tamed. Psychologists refer to it as the shadow self. The Bible uses the language of our sinful nature. The submarine, sublevel side of us, it has to be curbed. And it's a yellow submarine because we are all yellow belly chickens at dealing with temptation. It's yellow because... It's between the stop of red and the go of green. It is the caution of yellow. It is the tension of yellow. What choice will we make? As our worship team comes, I want to just cause you to think about a few things. Sometimes in life, you feel like you're in a submarine. It's very cold down here underneath the surface. It is dark under this turbulent sea. The, the pressure, the water pressure is so strong. The deeper I go, the pressure becomes stronger and stronger. Many voices around me are saying, you know what? Just take the plunge. Experience this. Just once. Just once and you'll never go back. You need to experience this. Man, you're going to love it. Just once. Sample this. Try this. This will take the edge off. This will numb your pain. No one sees anyway. No one cares. Just take a dive. Come on. Let's go deep. Forget all your pain. Here's the way to numb your pain. But something deep inside of you is saying, choose the right valve. Something deep inside of you is saying, be very 
careful. Something inside you says, pick up my Bible. Have the courage just to try to read a little bit of the Bible. See if there's anything in there that could help me. Something inside you is saying, have the courage to pray to God and say, Lord, I don't even know if you can rescue me or not. Honestly, I just don't know. I'm ready to just dive deep. But I'm willing if, if you could find a way to rescue me. Have the courage to call out to him. And just notice how your spirit starts to surface. Just notice how the devil is required to resist you and go the other way. Just notice how he will open the escape hatch for you. He will do that for you. He really will do that for you. He'll give you the courage to to go to church. He'll give you the courage to be around people who are going to encourage you and inspire you and help you on your journey. Would you stand with me? Would you just pray with me? Oh, our Lord. Lord Jesus. Oh, God. Lord, I really feel the the anguish of some of the souls here today. Some of the ones that are watching online, this is a very timely message from you. Some of us can really relate to this, Lord. Lord, you know that we love you. You know us better than we know ourselves. So, Father, I'm praying that you bring your children to the surface. Some of us, we've strayed. Some of us, we put on weights and we've begun to sink deep. Oh, God, we need to be freed. Lord, oh, Lord, be our raft of safety. Lord, throw out to us our rescue. Let us latch hold of and float to the surface. Give us a way of escape. Oh, Father. Oh, God. While Stephanie leads us in this song, I want you to just use these moments to start doing some reflection. Ask the Holy Spirit to search the depths of your soul. Let him minister to you. Let him point things out to you.
So if you've had a hang-up that's been hounding you and bothering you, something that is your go-to, that you default to, when you are tempted and it just eats your sack lunch, this thing is more powerful than you and you just can't seem to get victory over it, guess what? Today is your day. God is bringing deliverance to you and setting you free today. God has a blue light special for you. And he says, if you will call upon me, I will liberate you. I will set you free. So all over the room, all of the saints, all of the hearts, we are lifting up our voices and we are declaring victory in Jesus. Praise you, Lord. We do believe in you. We believe in you, Lord. Victory for your saints. A new level of walking in confidence. A new strength. We will be careful that we don't fall, Lord. We're going to be looking for opportunities to walk in liberty and in freedom. Teach your people. Teach us to recognize when the enemy tries to sneak in. Let us recognize he is crafty. The, the old slew foot, he tries to sneak in and, and make something look palatable and, and make it look presentable and, and, and we can, and then we, we just slowly start going after it. But no, we recognize the trap of the devil and we will not fall for his devices. We will not be ignorant of the enemy's devices. We will educate ourselves like soldiers who are looking for IEDs all over the minefield. We will step carefully. We will walk under the obedience of our commander in chief. We will follow you wholeheartedly, God. So right now, if you need victory, just begin to shout out your victory. Lift up your praise to God who is setting you free. This is a new day. It's a new day, a new level of victory for you. God is for you. He's not against you. He proclaims victory over you. This is your day. Let's sing it, we believe.
Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord smile upon you and give you his peace. And may you be blessed. Have a wonderful day. Why don't you leave this room singing it out to him? We believe.